Live. All right, we are live. Hey. Uh, hello, happy World Oceans Day. Happy uh, World Oceans Day. Yes. Welcome to the Ocean Chat Google Hangout. I'm Kevin Connor from Conservation International. Uh, and I'm only going to be here for a little bit because it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Washington Post reporter and author of Demon Fish Travels Through the Hidden Worlds of Sharks, Juliet Alperin. So, Juliet, please okay. take it away. It's a great book. Thanks so much, Kevin. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm lucky to be moderating a discussion with three ocean experts. So we have, I'll, I'll try to do it assuming we, uh, now we're jumping around. I'll just start with Ian Sommerhalder, who's an actor and a philanthropist and UN Goodwill ambassador and founder of the Ian Sommerhalder Foundation. Co-founder. 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 And now, flipping over, we have um, Fabienne Cousteau, who's an oceanographic explorer, conservationist, documentary filmmaker, and leader of the Mission 31 expedition, which we'll be hearing a bunch about on this hangout. And then we have Dr. Greg Stone, who's chief scientist for Conservation International and someone I've been lucky enough to be on the water with in the past. So we're, we're going to, I think we should start, um, if we could start with Fabienne, I'd love to ask both uh, kind of two things, which is if you can explain why you are spending 31 days underwater, uh, I guess your eighth day, and also in, in that context, if you could talk about, I know, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, I was writing about how Aquarius was on its last leg, so to speak, and was about to be shut down due to a lack of funding, so if you could talk about both why this research mission is still active and the role that you're playing in it, that would be great. Well, I guess I'll start with the first one, which leads in, or, I'm sorry, your second question was leads into the first question, which is, uh, my grandfather had built some of the first underwater habitats, including one called Conshell 2, from which Mission 31 is based off of. But the fact that uh, Aquarius, which is the only undersea marine laboratory in the world, which is where I'm sitting right now at the bottom of the sea, nine miles offshore and 65 feet down. Uh, it, it, I came to visit uh, a lovely lady by the name of Dr. Sylvia Earle, which we all happen to know. And she was here with a number of folks fighting for the survival of Aquarius to show how amazing and unique it was. And that's what spawned off my, uh, my thought, which was something I wanted to do for a long time which is using an undersea marine laboratory or habitat to highlight the beauty, the fragility, and of course, the unknown in our oceans. So that's the reason why I created Mission 31, which is symbolically going one day longer than my grandfather did in Conchal 2, to honor not only the previous aquanauts in history, but also the next fin step in ocean exploration. And it really does uh, it is a privilege to be here because for the first time ever, at least on the Cousteau expedition, we're able to speak with you live from that expedition, this particular case, from a magical uh, underwater laboratory, which uh, we hope to be very successful in not only outreach, education, but also science. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And then I thought we'll switch over and ask Ian and, and Greg a couple questions. Ian, let's start with you. I'd be interested of why you became involved in environmental activism. Was this something that you were involved in when you were young? Did you come to it later? Could you talk a little about what, how you came to this and what you're doing right now on this front? Uh, very easy. Honestly, I grew up in the on the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, which is a very, very delicate ecosystem, and both my mother and father and my family instilled in us very, very, very young that the balance of nature uh, and its health, humanity's survival depended on that balance, truly, and that it was to be loved and respected and taken care of. So that's the first part, and and that bled into the rest of my life. And after the, the Gulf oil spill, I realized how fragile uh, that ecosystem is and that our dependence on this stuff called oil and our, and our lack of regulation to protect our oceans and seas is really, really, really detrimental uh, to the health of those oceans, therefore the health of ourselves, mankind. So I'm here with these incredible men and yourself and all these amazing people listening 
after going on this expedition, or after going down there today to spend some time with Fabian and Dr. Greg Stone and the whole crew down there, I realized the immense beauty that exists where he is right now, where I was just sitting there three hours ago where you are, <laughs> is unparalleled. And, you know, space, obviously they call space the next frontier or the final frontier. Well, the crazy thing is, is that space is right below us. He's in what's like the International Space Station, I think, and we know about as much about the oceans as we know about space, but oceans are here, and we need to protect them and understand them, and just like your grandfather said, Fabian, and, and I'll screw it up, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. people only love, uh, they only protect what they love, and they can only love what they understand, somewhere in that realm. So I think what we need to do is empower people with education, both young and old, with information and then give them an action to, to, to become activated and do. And uh, and that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping that's what that's not even what I'm hoping. That's what we are gonna do and it's a very, very hopeful, mm -hmm. amazing story. And um, you know, to empower this next generation to elect those officials and consciously use their dollar every day to vote and buy from corporations that are protecting these environments. Got it. Excellent. Uh, in Oh, yeah. This is, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, you know, I, I meant to say that uh, we were blessed to be able to have Ian and Greg down here earlier today, and Juliette, I hope we have you down here soon, because it really is a magical word, and, and Ian hit it right on the head. So, you know, through the power of, of our connections here and well beyond within our social circles, we really can make that big splash we have to do for the oceans, and it's with the power of the young people. Uh, that we're able to see a much brighter future, of course, for our planet, and to be able to highlight such a magical, unique place. This is, as Ian said, the uh, inner space station, and we're here on that frontier, which hopefully everyone will get to enjoy. Right, and, and now turning to Greg, and you also might be able to answer this question. I know we've only explored a fraction of the ocean. Do you know what the, I know it's a tiny percentage, what, what's, the, what's the percentage that people talk about? Do you know that offhand, or can you characterize sure. kind of what are the areas that we know, you well, know kind of what are the areas that are the most unknown as well, opposed to? I can make, yeah, that's a really good question, Julia. I'll make two comments about that. One is, that, uh, I believe the figure of places that we've actually visited in the ocean. Right in a submarine is down in the three or four percent range, it's just tiny. But to me, what's even more compelling and interesting is that we don't even have really great maps. We got better maps of Mars than we do of our own seafloor. Right. And, you know, this came up, I, I got involved with some of the uh, expert opinion when the Malaysian air flight plane w went missing. And, uh, I mean, they just don't have good maps of that part of the, the world's so ocean. They, there are maps, don't get me wrong, but there are some seamounts in the ocean we only know of because a, a satellite will detect a gravity anomaly. Hmm. And the, it, therefore, there's more mass right there, and there's a seamount. So, uh, you know, if we want to really you know, protect the oceans, we need to understand them and get out there and do more. And I think what Fa Fabian is doing uh, is fantastic. I, I've had the privilege of being an Aquarius three times myself, never for this long. But, you know, I think, Juliet, to your earlier question, these kind of projects and this kind of initiative is what we need to punch through and get into the public consciousness and begin to direct the people so that they will direct the decision makers in a way that's favorable to the ocean. Right. And just following up on that, you mentioned, right, because you had first... Been favorable to them. Right. And, and, and you had first gone to Aquarius maybe in the 1980s. Can you talk a little about how, you know, what, what's changed and broadly maybe if any of you could just talk about what's the science that's going on there right now? Because I think folks who are watching this would want to know about that. Uh, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was 89 or 90. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, uh, when I first dove in Aquarius or saturated, it was in uh, uh, St. Croix. And for okay. listeners, uh, the, the, you probably should say something about Aquarius. The unique thing about it is that it enables you to live underwater in, in what's called saturation. Your body saturates with uh, nitrogen to a maximum amount. In order to come back, you have to go through about a 20-hour decompression cycle, breathing oxygen and things like that. So um, Aquarius was moved to Florida, and uh, one of the things I noticed right, right away, I felt like I was visiting an old friend, which is all covered in coral and sponge now. Yeah, it's amazing. And yeah, can you tell Ian you were noticing that, right? That it seems well, integrated into the reef. Well, no, he he was saying earlier what was amazing, going back and seeing her down there. She's become she's a part of the reef. She's a part of the environment now. Yeah, Fabian could probably send some pictures for uh, for uh, 
Twitter and whatnot. But I mean, when I first went in her, Juliet, she was brand spanking new. Was just, <laughs> still smell the paint, uh, and now she's she's still very very serviceable, service, serviceable, but right. she's aging. Right, and well, so uh, you acquired. Yeah, I, I, I think Aquarius is not only a legacy on some level because she's been down here, uh, down in the oceans in some fashion for now two decades, of course been renovated several times, but on another level she's unique because of the fact that this is the only marine lab out there functioning today. In the 60s and 70s there were uh, a rash of them uh, because people truly believed in this platform not only for research, but potentially as uh, the next frontier, next uh, future underwater villages. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a lot to leverage by being down at this oceanic frontier. As, as Greg mentioned, uh, we live in saturation as opposed to a submarine, which is uh, separated from the environment as a one atmosphere vehicle going through the water column. Here, we're immersed in a uh, an amazing natural environment, and we live amongst the fishes. My grandfather used to say, in order to film a fish, you have to become a fish. I know. What's that? I know. That's awesome. Here okay. go. Coming through the portal right now. That's it's one of our divers who's uh, who is out there visiting yes. some of that oceanic frontier, and this is one of those invaluable tools in order to be able to bring back not only imagery but scientific data. We have a couple of scientists here with us right now from FIU as well as some coming down later on from Northeastern and MIT that are going to be studying with us uh, climate change related issues, uh, pollution issues, organic pollutants as well as inorganic man-made pollutants uh, which they're doing right now with some of the corals in the area. And of course, finally, predator prey fear behavior, which is more of a, a, a natural behavior that we're studying down there. So there's a lot that we're studying while we're at Mission 31. And there have been scientists using this platform for amazing work over the last 20 years, and maybe another five to 10 years, or however long she lasts. Right. Excellent. All right. I, we got some really excellent questions from, from folks that I want to throw out to you all. So, um, Caroline Yurpasen has a question for Ian, which is, what was the most exciting part of diving down to the Aquarius, and what... So, Ian, can you take that one? I'm sorry, what was the most exciting part of Ian's visit? Yes, of diving down to the Aquarius, and what did you learn when you were down there? That is the that is the question. I am simply channel, channeling Caroline in this in this instance. Well, I think being able to have someone as amazing as Ian and as Greg coming down together as a buddy pair to visit this uh, this little home, our little apartment in the ocean, uh, in in of itself is quite an honor. And being able to share with them, although they didn't have very much time down here, being able to share with them a little bit of our world and, and just a taste of what it's like to be down there. And I know Greg had a little bit of insight already since he's been down here several times. But it's really nice to be able to uh, connect with people such as them in a in a one-on-one -on -one or in a one-on-two -on -two real uh, intimate and immersive fashion uh, because it gives a much better sense of what it is that Aquarius is, why it's so special, why the outside world is so special. Now, Ian, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you had mentioned on your way out the door uh, that you had lived in the Florida Keys for a while. So you know how amazing the Florida Keys are, as well, of course, as the National Marine Sanctuaries, how important those are, and uh, how important those things are to all of us, whether we live on the oceanic frontier or whether we live a thousand miles away, the ocean represents our life support system, our health, and of course our natural resource bank account. Yeah. And Ian, as a, as a newbie, was there anything you were particularly struck by? Or on, on the dive itself, was there anything that, you know, that resonated with you? Well, I had, I had these strange, extremely visual aquatic dreams all night last night. <laughs> and then I popped up. <laughs> I didn't really go to sleep until probably 2 or 2.30 this morning. And then I woke up. My alarm went off at 6, and I jumped up. I was so excited. And then every part of the day, meeting this entire crew, this group of people, is phenomenal. I mean, these 
They could be doing anything else with their lives. And they were there, I think, at 5 o'clock this morning fixing the air conditioning. I mean, they're making sure this thing works. But going down, you're in the open ocean, and you swim around, and it's so beautiful. But you're in the open ocean, and then Fabian and Tom just said, come this way, watch your head. And I went under this maybe 24-inch ledge of steel, and then you pop up, and you're in what's called the wet porch, and you're, it's open air. It's like being in a bucket, but 650 feet below the surface of the water. And you take off your mask and your regulator, and it's the most <laughs> unnatural feeling because you know... Your brain tells your body you're underwater, and now you're taking off your mask and your regulator, yeah. and everyone's there, and there's Fabian, hey, what's going on? Shaking your hand, you have some tea, let's have a shower, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's dark. But the other thing is, is that the whole time I was down there, sitting with Dr. Greg and Sylvia Earle last night, having this conversation, it kept ringing in my head, and she said this right before we all split off um, to go to sleep. She said, there is no green without blue. And it, I just kept thinking about that all night and the whole time I was diving and realizing that people, I, w I would love for people to make the connection that without health down there in the blue, there is no green. There's nothing. And it's not a, what we were talking about, Fabian and, and, and Greg and I, it's not a doom, doom and gloom. This is a story of hope. You know, this is information of hope. And uh, the whole time. Um, well, that's and uh, that actually. I'm oh, sorry. No, go, go, yeah. go, go. Don't listen. To oh, me. Well, that actually leads to Lauren Ramsey. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Ian. Did you want to say something else? No. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll go. Lauren Ramsey. Oh, okay. Does that so? Lauren Ramsey asked related to that. So maybe you could expand on. You know, how does the ocean's health affect us, and what can we do to to change it? So I'm wondering if if you all could talk a little about that. Obviously, Fabien just made a reference to it being our life support system, and Ian, you were talking about that. You know, if you if you all could expand on that, I think that would be helpful. I think that's this one right here. Right. Sure. Um, well, you know, I think yeah. and this relates. I'd like to make a comment too about the space exploration because it kind of relates. The reason we've invested so many billions and billions of dollars in space is because we can see it. And it's been sort of the, lo the longing of humankind for millennia to get up there. And we've gone as far as we can feasibly at this point. The oceans are opaque. We can't see them. But guess what? Every other planet in our solar system you know, is a very inhospitable place to live. And none of them have oceans. The reason the Earth is a great place to live is because of our ocean. That, that controls the climate and it provides the other services that, that Fabian mentioned. And, you know, I, I would love to see a comparison between what we spend on space exploration compared to what it costs to run Aquarius. I bet you, I remember when we were flying the space shuttle, <clears throat> one space shuttle launch would have funded the Aquarius for 500 years. I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, you know, the, the benefits are climate control, food. A lot of people get food out of the ocean. Uh, we get a lot of recreation out of the ocean. Uh, it's it's really uh, so all-encompassing. Right. And Ariana Nelson has a question for Fabienne, which is, how will living underwater for 31 days affect you physically and psychologically, and what has motivated you to do so? Now, obviously, I think you've talked a little about your motivation, but let's talk about what, what it's like what, one week plus being down there, both physically and, and psychologically being in a constrained space underwater. You see, you, you're pretty, you're extraordinarily level, my friend Fabian, for being underwater. What are you, <laughs> eight or 18? I think, uh, I think people are expecting me to go nuts or something down here. For, for me, uh, it just feels like home. And one of the things that people uh, aren't, uh, I hope will we'll get a better grasp of is that even though the living quarters it's pretty small for six people. It's about the size of a school bus. It's 43 feet long by 9 feet wide. And Ian and Greg were just down here, and I'm sure they probably felt a little bit like it was uh, tight and cozy. Uh, the reality is that this is just where we do some of our dry lab work, where we eat, where we sleep. But the vast majority of the day, and this is what this offers us, is we're out there diving 6, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. That's the luxury that this offers us. And the whole reason why we're here is so that we can be out there in the wilderness. Um, so I'm loving being down here. As a matter of fact, if anything, after we're now in a day eight of Mission 31, 
I'm starting to feel a little bit of a disconnect with my uh, Earth Dweller friends. Uh, <laughs> it's almost feeling like this is becoming more home than anything else. Um, I don't know that I'll be saying that in a day 28, 29, 30. <laughs> I'll we'll be anticipating coming home, but it, it is a pretty magical place for now, and uh, it's a it's a small time price to pay for such a unique opportunity and and a unique experience that will stay with us for the rest of our lives. Okay, and now we we have a again we got a a lot of good questions, and this is one I like from a, a kind of a more practical one from Raffi Baker, which is what can I do as a twelve year old citizen of the Florida Keys to help preserve the quality of ocean water. So maybe we could talk about on the practical side whether it's through the organizations that you're affiliated with or just in the decisions that you make day to day. How is it that that uh, that can that can help protect the ocean? Guys? Who is that uh, brought to? Because we all have fantastic organizations that work in symbiotic uh, harmony. Okay. I and mean, I, I would, I would definitely. I, I would just for Ian or for Greg. Or I, oh I well. Oh, I was thinking. Well, well, why don't I mean? What I'm thinking is maybe you could all take turns chiming in on this. And what I'm interested in is both. Like, I think part of what she's asking us is, you know, obviously she's 12, so you know, both both for maybe still in school or just in your own life. How can you do things that affect the ocean? Uh, and then and then more broadly, you know, how is it that you work with broader institutions to do things? So why don't all three of you chime in? Uh, Greg, you look like you're about to speak. I can start with this. I mean, I think <clears throat> there's there's uh, there's things that 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 the young girl can do, such as don't use single-use plastic. The, the, every piece of plastic that's ever been made still exists, and most of it's in the ocean. And we're finding that it has a very detrimental effect on a variety of animals. Actually, it's starting to break down into micro particles and become incorporated into cell structures in the ocean. It's really Quite an alarming thing. So people can can make those daily decisions. Eat eat seafood that's caught sustainably. Um, lower your carbon footprint, etc. But the, the problems facing the ocean are serious enough that you really need a doctor. Think of think of the ocean as like a sick relative, and you can make it. You can make them comfortable, maybe with an extra pillow or a glass of water. But you want a professional doctor to come in and take care of it. And that's the kind of work that I think Fabian's organization does. It's the kind of work Conservation National does, and it's the kind of work that Ian's involved that with, through his foundation. So I, I think it's a balancing act between living your life sustainably but also supporting the real doctors out there who can t take care of the sick patient. That's, that's a great point. Um, and, you know, it's the difference between living on the planet versus living with the planet. And, you know, plastics are definitely a huge problem in the oceans, and this isn't a, a battle cry against plastics per se, but we're dumping one million pounds of plastics in our oceans every single hour. And that's obviously to anyone who thinks about it will be understood as a huge problem. Uh, now, plastics are useful for various reasons. We certainly can't live without them at all, but the reality is that we don't need something that's built to last 500 years for something that we use for 30 minutes or an hour in our lifetimes and then discard. Uh, beyond that, of course, there's the overconsumption of natural resources, so basically the clear cutting of our oceans, which is yet uh, another enormous problem. Uh, and, and it's an enormous problem, not so much, well, it's an enormous problem for a number of reasons, but more specifically uh, because it's uh, eating away the capital of our natural resource bank account rather than learning to live off that interest that it bears and therefore being able to live in much more harmony and balance. I'm really um, a big fan of young people because they know a lot more than we did at their age and they are much more motivated, motivated nowadays than at least my generation was. So the, the opportunity that we squandered in my generation, I certainly hope we as the older generations can bolster and encourage in the younger generations and help them uh, do something much better for the oceans or for the planet in general uh, to be able to uh, inherit what we've taken for granted. Great. And Ian, and Ian what, when, when folks come up to you and ask you about what you're doing and what, what they can do, what is it that you generally tell them? I mean, to be honest with you, primarily, you know, we deal um, in a lot of 
youth empowerment. And and I would definitely be so bold to say that the most undervalued, underappreciated, and underutilized, untapped resource in the world are simply our youth. Uh, and yet they make up half the planet, and they're going to be running the planet. So why wouldn't we give them the tools to do that? If you're 12 years old, I know you look at that at ocean destruction or climate change is a very vast and, and very complicated thing. So in order to distill it and, and simplify it, plastics are a really big thing. Even at the In Summer Honor Foundation, you can go online and there's a toolkit you can download and you can really get an idea of where your power is and identifying your passions. You can do anything. You can empower your friends, even in a school. You can say, hey guys, listen, let's make a drive or let's make a pledge or let's Let's talk to this member of the Senate or Congress or let's lobby this, not lobby, but let's talk to this mayor or this community leader and say, let's make a community pledge to keep plastics out of our water, A, because they are breaking down into a micro, I think they're finding it in the DNA of plankton. Yeah, it's becoming incorporated in some of the cell structure. And so it's cell, some, some of the cell structure, but right. this is something that can't happen. And as a 12-year-old, and it's an amazing point, as a 12-year-old, you have that power. And that's what's so exciting. And that's why it's that, you know, not doom and gloom, but it's this really amazing story of hope. So if you are 12 and you really want to do something, talk to your parents, talk to your teachers, talk to your friends, and say, let's make this pledge. Let's take this out of the equation. And I think that's a really amazing place to start. Really amazing place to start. And we're running out of time, but I wanted to... This, okay. this last Let's not forget that this is a tool we never had before. This, this is the power right here that uh, previous generations didn't have before. So education and communication is the most powerful tool. Yeah. No, yeah. Right. Share this information and, on this thing. Excellent. There you go. And so the last question, we have one from um, uh, Tiffany uh, is asking, several marine sanctuaries have been created lately. However, do they get enough means to be efficiently protected from, from poaching and pollution? Uh, I was wondering again, uh, you know, maybe obviously Greg and CI has done a lot of work on this. If you could talk about how there is this push to put some of the most ecologically valuable parts of the ocean off limits and you know, Fabian, I know you can speak to it too, and, and how much one, it's, it's one thing to, to say you're going to protect these areas, but do they get the resources to actually do that? Well, there's a whole, <clears throat> there's a whole range of uh, protected areas in the ocean, and there's a whole range of corresponding capability to, to manage them, study them, and, and protect them. I think, you know, the, the 20 years ago, when I first got involved in this kind of work, we, we knew there was something wrong in the ocean, but we didn't know what it was. We, we learned what it was like over the next decade, and then we figured out over the, what to do now, finally, after 20 years. We know the problems and we know what to do. And certainly uh, networks of protected areas that will maintain the natural capital of the ocean so that we can, humanity can derive sustainable benefits is part of it. There are other policy reforms that we need to do in terms of carbon emissions. There's other policy uh, reforms out there at national and international scale. So I, I'm really excited right now, Juliet, because we have the knowledge, and I think Ian just made a really good point. We have an army of half the world, young people, who are ready to engage. And I think it's, it's our responsibility through, through various things, like what Fabian's doing, to, to really you know, push this out. And I'd like to have a call out for your grandfather's book. Can you hold it up again, please? This changed, my, this changed my life. It was Jacques Cousteau's landmark book, I think in 1954, is that right? Yeah, I think you're right. It's, uh, right. I can look it up right now. <laughs> and yeah, and this is edition number one. Out the oceans for uh, the 1953. 53. Oh, was a year off. Yeah. Anyway, when I walked into the habitat, I saw that. I said, "Okay, this is the Bible, boys." <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he said. This is the Bible. <laughs> and if that book, you know, it's crazy. Think about this. This is a celebrated marine scientist, and 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 it takes, you know, it's. Obviously, your grandfather created such an, an amazing amount of information and love and compassion for the oceans that spawned many, many careers in ocean and marine science. But it's living proof. It's happening right here, and it's happening with you. And, and then it trickles down to me. I am definitely not a scientist. Uh, I don't even have a college degree. But, but, but I do have the ability, you know, 
to talk to these the most amazing, powerful resource in the world, which are these young people that want to make change, and they just want guidance. And when you provide them with information, and you empower them with that information, and you give them an action, all of a sudden they become activated. And so you now have these compassionate, educated, activated people who are just ready to go and make serious amounts of change, not only in their lives, but in the lives of their communities, which therefore into their states, their country, their continents, the world, and it's, you know, it's like Sylvia Earle said, we, she said, we have oceans. That's what makes life so amazing on this planet. She looked up, we were talking about space, and she looks up and she goes, there's a lot of unfavorable unfavor uh, environments out there. You know, like, <laughs> have at it, guys. What's the you option? Know? Yeah. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I know Greg and Ian are, um, uh, and, and Sylvia, as well as my father and others, are amazing people uh, and have dedicated their lives to highlighting how amazing the oceans are. And the more people that we can do that, the more we can save that, uh, that natural place out there. And, and by save, I mean protect uh, in a way that you were mentioning earlier, Juliette, which was those uh, natural marine sanctuaries. And, you know, Sylvia says it uh, right. You know, how much of your blue heart do you want to protect? Is, is that natural resource bank account worth protecting to the tune of 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 percent of the planet? There are some hot spots in the world that are definitely worth protecting, like Antarctica and certain places, geographically speaking, in the world. But, uh, of course, enforcement is always an issue because the oceans are vast. It's 99% of our world's total living space uh, or 73% of the world's surface, if you will. Uh, and, and it's very difficult to govern. So we really need to be able to have all, by, all eyeballs on the ground, uh, young and old, to be able to make sure that it's protected, you know, kind of a, a citizen protection program. Uh, and, and just keeping ourselves in check to make sure that those things are there for future generations to enjoy. As much as I'm sure we'd all like to go explore the oceans of Mars, if there is such a thing, uh, there, as far as we know, no such, no much prettier of a planet than our little ocean planet. Well said. Yeah, well Excellent. Said. Well, well said exactly, and uh, happy, oh, sorry. Ian, were you going to say something real quick? No. no. I would say happy World Ocean Day to all three of you. Thank you so much for taking the time and for the folks who joined us online. Um, yeah, so take care. So and, and I appreciate it. Thank you for taking yeah, time. Julia, yeah, Juliet, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Juliet, uh, Ian, Greg, okay. and the world, thank you all so very much. Happy World Ocean Day from the bottom of the sea. <laughs>